happy Friday, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, as well as friends of Baylor College of Medicine. And first thing I want to say is uh, I got a heavy criticism from my sister last week for the artsy side shot. So we're going like face to face. And uh, Janet, would you, you know, give her brother a break every now and then? Uh, anyway, it's been a really kind of good, uh, well, I'd say good and bad, but good week. Um, I think in multiple ways. We escaped beta. It's so bad now that we were into the Greek alphabet to start naming storms. Uh, a rain event, but not a wind event. Uh, got a little wet, had a little bit of trouble walking Lily. It was not pretty, but we, we got through it. Uh, but the other thing is the numbers are looking uh, still pretty good. And uh, let me go through the numbers first. I always like to go over the, our numbers for the Texas Medical Center and our surrounding nine counties. Uh, as you'll recall, you remember I, I've said, let's not follow hospitalizations to look at community spread. Let's look at the real community numbers. And we look at three key numbers, the uh, effective reproduction rate, the R number, uh, the daily new cases, and the test positivity rate. So for the last couple of weeks, we are floating below that magical one for reproduction number. That means we're winning. Uh, the virus is abating. We're having less than one-to-one -one transmission. That's all good. That really reflects our behavior, the fact that people are we wearing masks and, and uh, physically distancing. That's all good. Our test positive re positivity rate is down under 4%. Now, before we get too excited about that, uh, New York is at 1%. And we need to start to get around 2 and 1% before we really feel like the, the virus is well down. But our target was to get below 5%. And as you recall, we talked about getting under 200 cases in our region every day. And actually, we are down to almost uh, under f around 400 or 350. Uh, you can translate that into, you know, 5 to 10 per 100,000. And that's the hardest number we have because that number comes from the state. And I'll show you some data, but basically the state has been batching numbers uh, and reporting them out as the day that they receive them rather than the day that there was a test. So if you send off, a, if a, a test was sent off to uh, uh, one of the commercial laboratories three weeks ago and it arrives today, they report it as today rather than three weeks ago. So that's been a continuing problem around our, our daily uh, new case rate. Uh, one of the other good things is we have been waiting with bated breath at the big spike that we thought would happen after Labor Day. That hasn't materialized. It should be materializing now, and it hasn't. So it's, it, it may be possible that we have learned something. Uh, we went through Memorial Day, we went through uh, July 4th, all focusing on it's not a real problem and personal freedom, and things got ugly, and guess what? Mask wearing has really helped, and I think it went through Labor Day, and it looks to me like we are going to get through without having a giant uh, spike. So that, that is incredibly good and I'm really proud of our community, frankly, for, for doing that because that's something we do. That's not something that, you know, the president does, the executive branch, the state. I mean, they issue a, an order, but we follow it. If you follow it, if we in the community follow wearing masks and being physically distanced and not having big gatherings, that's how we make progress and, th and that shows that we in Houston are actually making progress. The other thing I wanted to show you is an example of why we've been having problems. So this graph, which you will get to see in, in, up close, shows that in the green there are the older cases that have been reported like today. And there are literally <laughs> several thousand cases that are old that were reported today. So that means these cases that are positive being reported as new cases actually were new cases in July. So it tells us two things. One is that that peak that we had, that surge we had in July, was a lot worse than we actually anticipated because we're just getting results from that and they're showing up as positive now. They weren't counted back then and it means that there were thousands more cases in July uh, when we were reporting only 2,000 or 2,500. There was probably three or 4,000 cases then. And the other thing is it's overestimating the number we have now. So if you take those away and look at what we're doing now, we're in that 200, 250, 300 range. So we're getting there. And then further evidence that that's the case is if you look at our hospitalization numbers, 
which is a lagging indicator. Remember, you got to get you got to get infected, get symptoms, get sick, get sick enough to go to the emergency room, get sick enough to be admitted to the hospital to get an admission. So that's a lagging indicator often two, three weeks after the infection rate, but those numbers have been stable and they're not quite down to where they were in April and May, but they're down. They're down in under 100, you know, back before in April and May it was in 50, but they're under 100 now. So we are clearly, clearly making progress. So I'm very, very proud of the Houston community and everything we're doing. Now, uh, the CDC has had a rough couple of weeks. Uh, I remember Dr. Redfield from the NIH days. Uh, it's been a mixed week for the CDC. First of all, uh, there was a, a, a publication that came out about the possibility that there's aerosolization of COVID-19. A few days later, that was pulled, and that started a big uh, frenzy in the press about what's going on. The CDC's that saying things, and it turns out it was an internal memo that wasn't supposed to be published. Well, forget all that stuff. Uh, just remember in the few early few weeks when we talked about a call uh, center and one side of the entire call center was positive and the other side was negative. Uh, and there was the restaurant we looked at where there was the ventilation going through the restaurant. There was an outbreak in the church choir in Washington. All those events make it pretty clear that there's aerosolization or at least it's being transmitted through the air. So, to, to, you know, I mean, it doesn't take like a rocket science to figure that out. The good news that, you know, and, and let me explain why that's a big debate. If there's aerosolization, then it seems like it's much worse than just droplet spread, like uh, the droplets from a sneeze, which I will, <laughs> I'd like to demonstrate again. No, I won't. But anyway, if it's in the air, it's much scarier, like, you know, measles. It gets in the air and it's highly infectious. Well, the, the evidence that just putting a mask on uh, helps that is, is overwhelming. So even if there is aerosolization, and there probably is, it, it probably doesn't last that long. We haven't had any outbreaks that are established from outdoor events. And so, you know, I, I think it's almost a moot point. I'd say, yes, it's likely aerosolized, but masks and being outdoors help a lot. So th that's all very positive. Uh, the other kind of thing that's been going on is the question of, are we doing enough testing? And, and uh, uh, Brett Girard, who used to be here at the Texas Medical Center, got a little irritated and goes, I'm tired of people asking me about that. It's got to be smart testing. Well, uh, I actually think uh, the, the Harvard publication that says we need to be doing like 20 million, 30 million a day, and Brett Girard going like, well, we need to be smart about it. I think there's some truth to both of those things. So we certainly need to be able to test anybody who's symptomatic. So all those new cases that we're getting, every one of those need to be tested. There's several, you know, with five, 600 a day. They, we, we need to test those. And probably they all have 10 contacts, that's 6,000 a day. Uh, and then if you multiply that, you know, uh, times five or 10 to be able to look at the, you know, in the population, maybe 50, 60,000, we have the capacity to do that. And we should probably be doing that. I think the real key is how do we test when people start going back to schools? Uh, if you look at what's going on in the MBA, if you look at what's going on in the entertainment business, where there's daily or every other day testing, Duke University every second or third day, uh, there are some universities that are testing daily. As we move into schools, we're going to be able to do that. We're going to need to do it daily. The problem is you can't do that with qPCR. It just it's unrealistic. Once a person gets a swab pushed up their nose into their brain, they're not going to want that again, or they don't like it again. So it's, uh, it's not the best way to test daily. So the good news is there are new tests coming out, the antigen capture tests, which are swabs, a little bit more like uh, something you do like a pregnancy test with a, a color indicator, and it, it's, it, it can be within 10 to 15 minutes. Those are the ways we're going to be able to do the testing that we really need to do. And of course, we're going to always need to validate those tests with a qPCR. So it doesn't get rid of the need for the PCR test, but it will be a way to test daily and maybe confirm the positives that come up uh, by doing qPCR. So that's one of the, the important uh, developments that we're waiting for. I think it's on the verge. Uh, Abbott has already uh, created a number of these tests that the government is now getting. There are other vendors, but I think we'll be seeing a, a lot more today, very soon. The other thing I wanted to talk about uh, is the vaccine world. Uh, Lots of vaccines under development, a lot of talk about the vaccines. Uh, I talk, mentioned last week uh, about the, the adenovirus vaccines being developed. 
but I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of how you develop vaccines. Uh, there are over 90 to almost 100 vaccines in development. Uh, and that happens preclinically. People are developing these constructs, uh, looking in, in, in animal models to see if there's a response in mice or primates. That's the preclinical stu studies. And those that look promising go into a phase one trial. And the phase one trial really is given to a very small number of people to test safety, to make sure it's safe, and then dosage. Uh, there are about 24 or, or so tests, uh, vaccines now in phase one. If you look at phase two, which is an expanded, you start giving it to hundreds of people and start looking at specific segments, uh, different age groups, the elderly, uh, those with other problems. Uh, you begin to see how those are, and there's about 14 in, in, in phase two. And then the efficacy trials are giving uh, this, that vaccine then to thousands of patients, uh, usually in the, in the range of 30,000. Of, of those at trials, there, there are nine in, in progress and three that you've heard uh, in our country about the FDA. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some approved, and when they're approved, we start actually uh, creating, started delivering them to the people. So right now, there are several adenovirus vaccines out there. Uh, there's one in China that uses a human adenovirus. Uh, there's one in Russia that uses another, that also uses a human adenovirus. And the AstraZeneca one, which actually uses a chimp adenovirus. And why, why the difference? Well, as I mentioned last week, at, we, a lot of people get adenovirus infections as kids. It's very common in child care settings. So you're going to get a lot of immune response to, to adenovirus that's human. Uh, so there's a reluctance to do that because every time you give it, you're going to have a giant immune reaction. That's positive in that you wanted a strong immune reaction, but it can be negative because of the side effects. The AstraZeneca one is a chimp adenovirus. You're unlikely to be exposed to chimp adenovirus unless you live with chimpanzees or work in a zoo. So it's unlikely that you're going to actually have uh, any kind of experience with that. And so that is a, a virus that's not going to induce the same kind of vigorous immune response and will deliver the, the, um, the proteins that you want from coronavirus, it's that spike protein. So that uh, is interesting. Uh, unfortunately, the AstraZeneca trial was stopped when one person developed a severe complication, uh, a transverse myelitis, which is a disease that involves the spinal cord, uh, inflammation of the spinal cord that can lead to uh, paralysis and, and, and very serious complications. Uh, the trial was stopped in, in the UK and in the, in the US. It was restarted in the UK and there's a second patient that now has developed transverse myelitis and, has, and as a result, that trial has not restarted in the United States. Um, it's hard to know why they did that. Uh, is it the adenoviral vector or is it the spike protein? My guess is it's the spike protein because Remember, we've talked about this in the past, but the protein receptor, the way that the virus gets into cells, is in the ACE2 receptor, which is very, very common in all kinds of small blood vessels, including blood vessels that uh, wrap around the spinal cord. Uh, and so I, my, my guess is it is actually a complication related to um, uh, the spike protein, but we'll have to see, we don't know. The other two uh, that are going on now, the Moderna and Pfizer, are mRNA vaccines. mRNA vaccines have the unfortunate uh, problem of you have to give them twice. They also have to be stored at minus 70 degrees. And at minus 70 degrees, it's extremely difficult to administer these, and they're not very stable. And so that's, there's a real problem with distribution uh, with both the Moderna, Pfizer, and, uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. The fourth vaccine that was just announced uh, to be entering phase three is the J&J &J vaccine, which once again uses a human adenovirus. This time it uses an adenovirus in humans that's fairly rare, adeno-26. So the idea again is that you won't, probably haven't been exposed to it, and therefore you might not have uh, a, a reaction that's uh, too vigorous. But the good news is because it's an adenovirus and does induce a strong immune response, unlike the mRNA vaccines, it looks like it's only once one, uh, one injection. So the difference between one injection and two injections is huge when you start thinking about distribution. So, you know, if you have to, if, you know, they announced that there'll be 100 million uh, vaccines available 
uh, within the first quarter of next year talking about the Moderna and, or Pfizer vaccine. Well, that's only 50 million people, which is not enough to really give to the general population. It would take another quarter or two before they're available. The J&J &J one, which is one vaccine, you could actually scale up much easier. It's much more stable. Uh, it's easier to, re you can stable in refrigeration. You don't need the minus 70. So there's a lot of positives about uh, the J&J &J vaccine if it happens. Uh, there's a number of other uh, vaccines that are taking place right now. There's uh, the ones I've talked about, the inactivated virus. There's some that are nanoparticle vaccines. Uh, Merck is pursuing a live virus vaccine. Uh, and uh, there's some recombinant protein vaccines, in particular the one that um, Peter Hotez is working with, uh, in, with BioE uh, and an India company. So there's lots on the horizon. I think that we're likely to see something positive uh, soon. Whether or not that is going to be available in broadly to the public uh, before the second quarter of next year, I think is extremely, ex uh, very unlikely. And the last thing I wanted to finish with uh, is a, a couple of shout outs. Uh, it, it always amazes to me, amazes me when we have some weather event, uh, how people step up here. Uh, uh, you know, in another place, they would have shut down the ent entire campus. We not only didn't shut down campus, we were open the whole time. We saw uh, you know, 1,100 patients who needed care in our clinics. Uh, we did a lot of this through telehealth. Because of the COVID pandemic response, we're extremely well prepared to deal with minor weather events like hurricanes and, and tropical storms. So uh, it was actually really terrific. Our scientists and, and uh, trainees were working all the time. Uh, the people who came in with the facilities, in particular Mike, who's always there for us. And by the way, I want to do a shout out for Mike's mom because she always watches. But Mike was there as he always is to take care of the facility. And everybody who's working uh, on operations, uh, it's just really huge, uh, hugely important for our institution. And the last shout out I want to do is for Justin Reed of Houston, Texas. Justin, through his generosity, gave a number of uh, tablets to our students. Uh, a lot of our work now is done, you know, online, and not every student has a, has the computer need. And Justin Reed uh, contributed many computers to our students in need. So I really want to do a great shout out for Justin. Like our students, he's working hard, not only as a football player working, uh, playing for the Texans, but he's also getting his degree in engineering from Stanford. So uh, we're behind you, Justin, as much as you're behind us. So thank you all. And finally, I want to thank the entire Baylor College of Medicine community. If it weren't for you, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. I mean, it is, it is you at the Baylor College of Medicine our faculty, our staff, the, you know, our, our trainees, learners, the people who work here. Uh, it's so important, you know, our board of trustees. I, I, I did a, um, a, thing, a review of the, all the work we're being supported by the donors of our community. I want to thank our donors in particular. If it weren't for that community of people, we wouldn't be where we are. So I want to thank everybody in the greater Baylor College community and all of you who just support us that aren't part of us necessarily, but listen in and, uh, and ask questions and support us in the community. Thank you for everything you're doing too. So you are officially part of our community as well. So have a great weekend and I look forward to talking with you next week.